Okay, today is March 1st. We are at the Sailfish Club in West Palm Beach. This is Chris Payton, and the other voice on the tape will be Mr. Bill Harbeck, a good friend of Johnny Mercer. Um, part of what we're doing with this project is trying to fill in the gaps around the professional life of Johnny Mercer. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for talking to his friends is to find out more of what he was like as a person. Mm -hmm. How did you come to meet him? I met him through his, one of his, uh, or his oldest friend, they grew up as boys, his name is Jimmy Downey. Mm -hmm. And they both came out of Savannah together. I think Jimmy came up to New York before Johnny did, and he got into advertising. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Johnny came up, uh, I guess uh, Jimmy showed him around the new, the new big city. And I became, uh, he, Jimmy became my best friend too, and through that setup I, I met Johnny. But when was that? I know he went oh up boy. to New York in the late 20s. Oh yeah, no, this would be uh, about 1941, 42. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just during the war, just the beginning of the war. Okay, so he'd already then been working in Hollywood. Oh yes, yes, he, had always, he already was a big name. Okay. Oh yes, he was already a big name. And I think he was on the uh, board of ASCAP, or, or about to be. Already by then? Yeah. I didn't know that. I'm not sure. You better check that. I, 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 he may have gotten on a little later. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were in New York. Yes, and, I lived in New York. And at least initially, the, the times you and Mercer were together were largely New York. In New and, York and uh, Beverly Hills, Beverly California. Hills. And uh, when I was out there, I, I, uh, we played with Johnny and Ginger and, and uh, great parties. He was a great cook, you know. I've heard that. Oh, he what cooked. He cooked booyah biz. It'll knock your socks off. Did he? Oh, he was marvelous. Oh. Yeah, he he loved it. We heard about spaghetti. I hadn't heard about the booyah biz. Yeah, he did a booyah biz. It was wild. It was marvelous. And he had a cat called Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. To I guess after the advertisement of the Chesapeake Ohio Railroad, they had a cat Chessie. sleeping on a. And uh, they they lived on the Long Prey, I think, Avenue, in, in uh, just below the Strip. In the year, original days, Johnny. When that he was, was the first house? Yeah, the I think one that was the first house, right. Picket fence around That's it. That's it, right. The one that, that Ginger painted? That's it. Okay. Um, so you got together casually then? Yes, well, through friendships and, and parties and dinners and, and uh, not, not through work. However, at the end, I, be, I became a television producer mm -hmm. and director. And I did uh, a Bing Crosby special. We have a copy of that. Isn't that a modern, that duet oh, we had gorgeous. with Bing and, and Johnny? And it was the old radio days. It's absolutely gorgeous. Isn't that marvelous? It, it made my hair stand on it. Good for you. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. That's nice. I was very proud of that show. Good. What was it like when he had parties? Would, would he just call you up and say, Saturday night, come on oh, over? Yeah, or? Oh, yeah. That right. Or I'd, well, I'd give parties. And Johnny and, and or Ginger, Ginger, you know, you guys got to come over next Thursday or we're giving us something. And they'd always were they were for free would always come over mm -hmm. was this professional type parties or close uh, friends or? well no, no party parties i party mean parties. there would be professionals there mm -hmm. but it was not uh, you know strictly although i would go out when ascap would come out mm -hmm. and uh, they would have a, a, a big ascap meeting the yearly meeting and then they would some one of the one of the writers would give a big party for the board and naturally johnny would be there mm -hmm. and i sometimes i got involved with that what was it like at his home uh, cozy, uh, understated, uh, nothing pretentious, absolutely nothing pretentious. Uh, marvelous things all around, of awards and things like that, and, and, and memorabilia of his career. But very, uh, no she she, no she, just very simple, straight away, unpretentious. Mm -hmm. No glitz. Mm -hmm. Not lots of household no, help. No, or no, 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 none of that. All that kind of thing. None of that. Um, what was his reputation? You know, you have some friends, and you say, "Oh, so and so's always bubbly or perky, or so and so." He was darling. He was. I mean, he, he uh, had a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one cute story. He, he number one, he he terrified of flying. I've heard that. He absolutely. You say the word airplane, and he he start sweating and he would always use the train and he loved trains well look at the, all the songs he wrote about trains mm -hmm. and he told you one time he was he said he he we were having a party at, in New York and he had just come in from California he and Ginger and he said that 
cutest thing happened on the diner last night on the 20th century. He said this very nice black waiters, you know, they were all black in, in, uh, in those days. Yeah. Uh, he asked for uh, uh, some apple pie and uh, they, had, uh, they were all out of it. And Johnny looked very, you know, he, was, he wanted one. He said, all right, just a cup of coffee. And the waiter saw his disappointment. Now, the waiter, all the waiters, there's another thing, all the waiters, after years and years of traveling, all knew that Mr. Mercer's aboard my train oh, today. Did. Oh, absolutely. He'd know 90% of all the, all the, uh, the uh, Pullman porters and everything. We'll break for a second? Sure, I think so. Okay, go ahead. I think she's going to just lay her plates on and then... Okay. Give me a, let's get on here. Okay. So all the porters through the years got to know the Mercers because they were always on the train either going east or west. Mm -hmm. And this waiter uh, went back to the kitchen for about eight or nine minutes and he came out with a big smile on his face and had an apple pie. And, and Johnny's telling the story and he had that modest southern accent. And he said this modest waiter said, Mr. Mercer, this is the onlyest pie, apple pie on the train. <laughs> And he loved he had that marvelous chuckle. You, <laughs> that cute Johnny Mercer laugh. Okay, should we stop for a little? Yeah, let's stop and do a little mange. I forgot where we were last. Well, we were talking about uh, trains and Pullman porters. Oh, that's you, right. You had yeah, finished yeah. that story. Mm -hmm. Did he ever overcome his fear of flying, or did he remain? Uh, I think he did. A, a, no, he always terrified him, but I think once, once in a while he had to. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he wrote a model song, The Air Minded Executive, you know yes. that song? Yes, yes. Which is cute, and he just, but flying just panicked him. Mm -hmm. So he and wasn't he, an air minded executive himself? No, he was not. Okay. Um, let's see, so you knew him from the 40s straight on through then. Mm -hmm. Did you get together for vacations or anything like that? I know Mrs. Bach remembered well, in her yes. early days that they'd gotten beach houses together. Yes, in up in the, at West Hampton. Oh, we're, actually, we did some time at, uh, I think, in, uh, what's it called, in Long Island, uh, Jones Beach, mm -hmm. you know. When and, was that? And, and then we, run, we, we rented a house about two houses away from uh, West Hampton one summer. Mm -hmm. That's when little Jeff was, uh, was about five or seven years old or something. So about 1950 maybe? That's right, about 50, a little right more than that, about 53, 54. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would have friends up, the box for example, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I would have Jimmy down in, but, and we were all, it was, it was like a little enclave of uh, us. Mm -hmm. So there were about eight of you then, because yeah. it'd be the box, yeah. the downies, yourselves, and, and yeah. the mercers. That's it. You guys must have been scary together. Oh, You're some God. neat people. And we'd have such fun at night because we'd play jazz all night long and Johnny knew so much and so did Gene mm -hmm. and Bob and Jim and Al. It, it, it was just out, they were the, the golden days. When you played jazz, did somebody play piano and somebody sing? Or no, these were records, records or something and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. kind of. Well, I'd, I'd give parties in New York. I lived in a little tiny uh, apartment when I first got married in 1948. And uh, I'd give, you know, fun parties would last till four in the morning, and there'd be musicians there, and like Cy Coleman before he became Cy Coleman, and and Johnny, if he was in town, would always be ass or ginger, and they had a little spinet piano, and I remember Johnny singing ad, ad lib songs to people that were in the room, mm -hmm. to you know the the. Uh, you remember the Newsy Bluesies? I've heard of them. Yeah. I haven't yet heard, well, actually heard When them. he was doing the Camel Caravan with Benny Gooden, mm -hmm. uh, he was the guest star every week. Mm -hmm. And there was a section of that radio show where he, they called it the Newsy Bluesy, and Johnny would get a newspaper of the day, that day that it was broadcast, and make up a song about the headlines. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so, at, so of the moment, it was fascinating, and it brought the house down every time with marvelous rhymes. He could rhyme in eight seconds anything. Really? Oh, he was unbelievable. But he'd do these, he'd take the newspaper and uh, do a, of all the headlines and he'd do a song about it. You know, a, a beat, it was like the blues mm -hmm. and they called it the Newsy Bluesies. Sounds like days I should have been oh, around for. Oh boy, <laughs> I loved being involved with that, that whole section. It was marvelous. Jean Bach mentioned having a gallery at her home 
where Willie the Lion Smith yes. was there. Were you at that? I was there. What and can I, you tell me? About, when was it? Well, or can boy, you now you're getting of, me. <laughs> I would guess it's about <coughs> 1950, 51, 52 in that okay. ballpark. And what did like? Oh, every the whole world was always over at Gene and Bob Box. I gathered that. Oh. How did this one come about? Was it a formal invitation thing, or no, did no? Just it just uh, they gave a party, and and naturally Johnny was always asked, and Ginger, mm -hmm. and we were always asked, being you know, and then Willie the Lion was asked, and I think Margaret Margaret Whiting was there. No, no, not Margaret Whiting. Who was there? Lee Wiley. Mm -hmm. And and. It, it just it was just like an open house. It was kind of like an open house at their parties in the village, and they always get marvelous parties. Do I see you see Duke Ellington there? You'd see uh, uh, all kinds of people, big musicians, little musicians. It was just marvelous, and uh, it, it, it was a very gemütlich surrounding. What was that night like? I mean, oh, it was marvelous. I've got that acetate. You do. I should get it to you. We'd like to copy it if you do. Uh, uh, yes, it's an acetate. It's a little scratchy, but uh, Bob had it made. Uh, this is before tape, too. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a long time ago. And uh, Willie the Lion is playing this marvelous stride piano. Mm -hmm. and you could hear Johnny laughing in the background and all of us roaring. And Willie the Lion played with a cigar in his mouth and a derby. All of us mm -hmm. had the derby on in, the ha how, in or out of the house. And he would talk about these melodies that he was playing. And he was talking about when he played in the whorehouses in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And he would, and then I'll never, one line is kind of our, uh, Gene and I's favorite signal to each other. In one, the, you'll hear it on the record, he says, uh, oh, those days I can't forget. Uh, Willie the Lion, you mm -hmm. know, and it, 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 they were marvelous parties. That particular one, she told me, started at her home, or at least the one she was describing to me, started at her home and then she said things were things were going well, but she sort of wanted a more controlled setting, and it moved then to a recording studio. You mean not that <coughs> night? You mean you mean? Well, I couldn't party? quite tell from no, what she told me. No, I don't. I don't think that, that. No, that night we were. That was it. We. we I think we were home at five in the morning. Or something. <laughs> it was a good night mm -hmm. then. Um, she said at any rate it, that it it took place again at a recording studio. Uh -huh. Was that where the acetate was? Yeah. <laughs> no, but this. Uh, this was done. It is this this one record that I have that I'll get for, to you, or mm -hmm. that I put it on tape, or send you the tape, or something. Or we can copy it. Remind we have, me. We yeah, have right. Equipment to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Let's see. You said that you then later worked together. Well, did you? You were friends from like the nineteen forties on. Did you? Did you work together much before Bing Crosby show? Uh, no. Was the first time I ever really worked. Well, yeah, no. Wait a second. I uh, produced the uh, Tonight Show with Steve Allen, mm -hmm. and every time Johnny was in town, I'd book him on the show because mm -hmm. Steve Allen was mad about him being a, a songwriter himself, and here's this giant, you know, who's going to come on our little. Uh, little television show late at night, one in the morning. So the Tonight Show wasn't then quite the thing. It no, it was just later. beginning to take off. And Johnny would do modest duets we'd work out with Steve. Mm -hmm. There's one time, and I had that record, mm -hmm. of Johnny said, I, I, you know, Bill, I just don't want to keep doing my songs all the time. He said, let me do other people's songs for a change. So I said, okay. So what we rigged up, Steve Allen, premise, mm -hmm. would say, they'd sit, sitting around the piano. Uh, Johnny, you know, you've written almost about every subject in the world. And uh, he said, well, I've written about a lot of them or something like that. But he said, let me see if I can catch you. Uh, uh, I'll, write, I'll sing a song of Cole Porter's or something like that. Or I'll sing one of your songs and you see if you can get a, everybody to match it. And, and he, was, he would do this duet with Steve and it goes about seven minutes and it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I'll send it to you. Thank you. We'll have time to talk later remind. about all the records you yeah. have. Um, okay, so then that would have been in the 50s, mm -hmm. the, the Tonight Show? We did about four or five of <clears> us. <throat> and one night, I think we did the whole show around Johnny with Stephen Eady singing and uh, Andy Williams and uh, I think Pat Kirby. Really? And Steve at the piano and Skit Chenis was orchestra. We did the whole hour and three minutes around his music. So, and these off and on, I'd been working in that way. And then when I did this Bing Crosby special, I had to have him because mm -hmm. Bing loved him. Mm -hmm. Legal way. And that's what, how that happened. Were th those Tonight Show programs, were they um, on Kinescope? Were they No, they were Kinescope, but... <laughs> long gone? Long gone. Okay. They burned them. Archivists ask, anyway. I know, the, it's uh, outrageous. 
there's been so much lost in, oh. in broadcasting. Well, there was some sad. nut I understand in New Jersey who, who was the head of the of the arc of the vaults, mm -hmm. and they, they like you know there's no Milton Berle shows. All oh, Mr. Those, those giant Milton Berle shows, gone? and they they he said I burned them. He said why? Well, you need room for more shows. I mean that attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean it was awesome. There was no control. No. Well, there there still isn't. I know it's outrageous. Um, Thank God for the Museum of Broadcasting. Yes. Oh, is that an important setup? And collectors who go dumpster diving and, right, and pick exactly. things out, which mm -hmm. is how we've gotten some of our better mm -hmm. things. Tell me about the Bing Crosby show. Well, Bing naturally would knew. Johnny from a thousand years. I mean, he had hit him on uh, his old radio shows before the war in the 30s and stuff like that. So they were all very old buddies, you know. So it was a piece of cake for them to, and we had them do duets together. Well, you know the show. You've seen the du mm -hmm. the show they did, the opening thing where it's on the street where you live. Where Bing Crosby's and walking. He's in a, and he's in a relaxed uh, in hammock. hammock. Was that supposed to be Spanish moss hanging? That's around? right. That's there you go. Kind of what we thought. <laughs> That's when we right. Thought. <laughs> And then they do that modest radio takeoff of the old days mm -hmm. and that cute dialogue. Yes. He never seems to be very comfortable in front of the camera, and that show is one of the really Johnny, relaxed moments. Johnny was quite humble. Mm -hmm. He was not arrogant. One thing he was not, he, he, uh, he was a very shy in a way. He was a shy man. And he was not the, the, the uh, egotistic at all. There was no egotism about Johnny at all. He was cozy and very unassuming and very easy to, to be with. He looks very bashful. Bashful. Generally. Good. That's a good word for it. On their kind of yeah, yeah. You know, eyes down. Yeah, that's right. Kind of yeah, that's right. Closed up. We saw a marvelous piece of footage that Margaret, somebody gave Margaret, that she'd forgotten doing it. I think it was the Kraft Music Hall show. Mm -hmm. And it's the two of them singing together some of her father's things and other things. And he's kind of stiff. Yeah. She's kind of, not, I mean, she's of course very fluid. Yeah, to get him going. Go on. And at one point he looks, he says, cut that out. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Know? Cut that out. But then the grin happens yeah. a little uh, bit uh, and he, he sort of loosens he up. He hated bit. anybody touting how good he, one was. For example, he th was embarrassed by Sammy Kahn. Really? And Sammy was like, and then I wrote this, and then I, now I did this, you know, and he said, how can anybody do that? You know, he loved Sammy, and he was, he thought he knew he was a great, but he, he the uh, chutzpah of Sammy rubbed, uh, rubbed uh, Johnny the wrong way. He would more like to be in the wallpaper and... Do you think that was basic personality, or do yes. you think that was Southern... No, his? well, Southern, Southern uh, attitude, and also uh, his personality. Mm -hmm. He was a complete gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear he read the Bible. I never knew that. We never talked about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But he knew knew the Bible, and he uh, he was just marvelous. We keep hearing that from He's people. A cozy man. What was he like to work with? Like that Bing Crosby show to, to, to rehearse or he, to? Oh no, anything you want, anything you want. Mm -hmm. Hey Johnny, uh, we got a problem here. Uh, this this ending's not working, and he said, "All right, I'll fix it." Mm -hmm. You know, and then he'd write, he'd go over to the corner with a pencil and write a new uh, new setup to the end of a song that we're doing in a duet or something, and boom, it always worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So rehearsals were comfortable. Oh, and then fun enjoyable. and games. Always show up on time. When, I remember when I called him to do this show. I was I was in. Uh, well, we're gonna have to. Uh, That's an amazing noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we're safe. Okay. Uh, I remember when I called him to, to book him on the show, because I was, I was uh, booking, I had Rosie Clooney, mm -hmm. and I had the four kids, or the, yeah, the three kids. Lindsay, Dennis, and Phil. Yeah, and I'm afraid they're all gone. It's heartbreaking. All three? Uh, two, two committed suicide. And the, uh, the third one passed too? Yeah, I think. Really? Oh, no, I think one is alive of that group, <coughs> because Gary just died. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And uh, I said, Johnny's perfect for the show. Bing said, great, get him. He, we'll have fun with him. Naturally, you clear all that stuff with Bing. You don't book a show that you're producing for Bing and just walk in with some of that uh, he didn't approve of. Anyway, he, all, he loved the idea of Johnny. 
and I call him up. I said, Johnny, and I said, what? What's happening? I said, Johnny, you got it. I'm, I've just been asked to produce and direct the Bing Crosby special, and you got to do it with it. He said, well, Bill, yeah, can I talk to you? He said, Johnny, I got to know. Not I, he said, well, I'm on my roof. We have a fire here, and I'm trying to put the roof fire out with a hose, and I could hear the crackling, and it was that terrible, terrible uh, fire they had that year. I put year was the 1960 where almost Beverly Hills was was inundated with, with it. And he was keeping the his roof oh. uh, wet down so that the flames all around the other houses were going. And I was booking him on top of a roof with trying to put a fire out. <laughs> Wild. It's amazing that he answered the phone. I know. There. And he kept saying, Bob, can I talk to you? I said, no, I got to know now. I said, well, Bill, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to put my roof fire out. <laughs> what kind of public reaction was there to the show? They loved Do you it. Because mm -hmm. that was so, would have been very early video for TV. Yeah. Well, it, it was good for me because it, it was such a good show that Bing says, I want Harback to do the next uh, special. And I did a two man show with Bing and Chevalier. Mm -hmm. They got on the cover of Life magazine. Oh, lovely. So uh, it, it was a good show. It made Bing happy. Mm -hmm. and that's the important thing. Of course. Let's see. You mentioned his southern accent. Did he really sound. Is he, to me, living in Atlanta, hearing the depth of accents that I hear, he doesn't sound that southern. Did he, in his, when he was in Hollywood and in New York, did he stand out as being southern? Uh, gently southern. I mean, not mm -hmm. not that heavy southern. Mm -hmm. In terms of manners or behavior, did manners were today? absolutely gentlemanly. Never said dirty words. No, you know, none of that. Really? No. Okay. Let's see, you guys were good friends. Did you go out drinking together? Yes. What was that like? Well, Johnny had one, one problem. Johnny, Johnny, some of us would have a little too much and he would get in a mood mm -hmm. that could get a little, uh, oh, a little dark. Mm -hmm. And it's probably just the other side of the coin, you know. But uh, we, I was got along great with him in those those periods mm -hmm. and he would uh, he would just get uh, moody mm -hmm. just check here to see how we're doing oh, be sure that we're okay yeah yeah we've heard that he likes scotch and yeah, um, he loved his uh, j and b did he, did he really j and b and uh he he loved to he, he loved to have a, a good time at night have you seen the gene lee's ass letter I'm sorry? Gene yes. Lee's jazz yes. letter. Have you seen the one that he did on Mercer? I, I th Roses in the morning? I, f I don't think I did. Okay, we, it was back in like 1983. Right, so, right, right. So right. it was a good ways back. And, and he talks a little bit about the drinking, but mm. Lee's also mentions that he was out on the coast at one point doing some writing and he got a call. And Mercer said, hey, I hear you're in town. He said, yeah, but I'm finishing this lyric and until yeah, yeah. I'm done, don't bother me. And he said a little while later, the doorbell rang and it was a delivery man from a liquor store with a case of scotch. Oh Lord. And <laughs> oh Lord. he said, I didn't order a case of scotch. You know? <laughs> now, this is compliments of Mr. Mercer. He said, a case? I'm only going to be here for <laughs> 10 minutes. So he said they held it for him, and for like years, he sort he of worked out of this, of this, this case immense of scotch. amount of scotch <laughs> that was sent from one lyricist to another yeah. to sort of help the process. Right, 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 right. I thought it was kind of cute. That is cute. Um, let me think what else we need to hear. <laughs> Well, there's that one time I was in the car talking about writing and music, yeah. and we were, I remember we were in New York City, and we were going down 90, I can remember going down 96th Street towards the East River, and we were waiting for a light, we were talking about uh, songwriting, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, uh, you know, the mores of, of uh, I said, are you working on any, on any new songs, John? He said, no, not of the mores. And he said, and we were talking about the mores of living in, in the in the 60s, and it was, everybody was doing people's wives, and it was, you know, everything was an open, seemed like open field. And he said, I've got a great title, but I, I would never write it as a straight song. Uh, it would have to come out of a show, uh, out of a situation in a show. And he said, Bill, if, if I tell you, don't tell anybody, because someday I think it's a cute title, and I'd like to use it. But it's got to be in a, in a situation mm -hmm. uh, about somebody uh, having an affair with a, some man's wife. And I said, I, I, I'm sealed. 
And he, I said, what, the, what was the title? He said, Your Wife is the Love of My Life. Isn't that a marvelous title? It's a marvelous title. And he it said, really but don't is. tell everybody. Now, after he died, I told Steve Allen. And Steve wrote a very nice lyric, not like Johnny could write it. Mm -hmm. And in it, he says, with, uh, 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 with apologies to John Mercer, whose idea this was. Mm -hmm. So it did then, yeah, even though he yeah, didn't get to do it. Yeah, it came after right. he passed away. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the um, trip to Savannah. Oh, that was fun. When, uh, when was it? Oh, that? boy, you're hitting with dates, and I'm terrible with dates. Researchers will ask yeah. us about dates. I would guess it's about, it's in the late 50s. Late 50s, okay. Or middle or late 50s. And uh, we went down by train, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, my then wife didn't like to fly either. <laughs> and it was fun. Trains are fun. You know, that's when they had dining cars and none of this plastic food and plastic knives and everything. Mm -hmm. Tablecloths and everything. It was, it was Waiters. All, and yeah, and all that stuff. And, and we went at, uh, down to Pennsylvania Station and Johnny took us, met us at the station in Savannah with a big, long, and there weren't many in those days, stretch limo. Mm -hmm. I guess it's the kind that you took people to airports in in those days, remember? That's kind of what Mrs. Bach Yeah, it was not it was like a, kind of a Cadillac. It was like an airport limo mm -hmm. with four rows. Of, and all of us were wined and dined and taken in that car around all of Savannah, and he's showing us all the sites, all the histories of the Civil War and his family and where he went to school. And then we'd go to his house on a little tiny river that has been changed now to Moon River. Mm -hmm. And it's just the south of Savannah. And uh, the whole weekend was, he, he, we didn't pay for a thing. He, he, he put us up at the hotel, pay for the whole bill. He was just sensational. And we had a great time. That was New Year's? I think it was about that time. Mrs. Bach yeah. thought it was a New yeah. Year's weekend. I think it was. Week kind of thing. And we, we, were, we thought we were all gonna you know, ship in and he said, we couldn't pay for anything. That's couldn't pay for, the, you know, you know about the thing, but his, his father's dead. Yes. And that's a beautiful story. Yes. How did people react to that oh, they, in, in the business? Or oh, they just thought it was, it was too good to be true. It was so nice and so high class, uh, an act to mm -hmm. do that. And he didn't want his name known, but it got out. Be hard that he paid off the debt. Very honorable thing to do. It, well, see, he's just, Southern honorable, you know, he was marvelous. In the most recent group of things that came, there was a bundle of letters, mm -hmm. and a lot of them were from that public response. To of that I guess there was like a Coronet article or a yeah, well, I'm was, sure press coverage. Oh, it was all across the country, they knew about it. And, and people wrote saying, you've restored my faith in, in yeah. human beings. In human beings, all this human dignity. Mm -hmm. Beautiful gesture. Yes. I'm going to turn the tape over right. before we lose anything. Okay, let's make sure we're going again. It seems to be. Mrs. Bach mentioned that you and Bob Bach handle his memorial service, and you also mentioned to me that you were fairly close to the situation during his last illness. Yes. Can you tell me? Well, about let's that? go back. Let's it, it, let's see where it, when it started. It started in London. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny was working with Henri Previn, and I, what was the name of the show? The Good Companions. You got it. That's it. And it seems, I was there at the time, uh, but that the rumor had that he was waiting for a bus and a bus had hit him, he thought, because he had some kind of an accident and fell down. And uh, then it wasn't a bus or whatever it is. I guess they were keeping it quiet because it was, I think he had a little tiny stroke or something, but he, they f discovered that he had a tumor. Mrs. Vox said that he was sort of unaccounted for for a couple of days. That's right. That he ended up in a hospital. Yeah. And nobody yeah. knew where And they was. kept, they hushed it up because I don't, yeah. I wasn't there at the time, but I'd heard about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was this, this is months before he even came over to the States. Now, as the tumor got bigger, he started getting dizzy spells. Mm -hmm. I don't think he, he passed, uh, passed out again. But when he came back east, now he, again, I remember I told you, he was terrified of doctors and hospitals. And he was getting, it was getting bad. And I think this is about a year and a half later, he comes back and coming through New York, getting on a train to go out to LA because he won't fly. I said, John, I was, uh, I think divorced at the time. 
And I come on up, we'll have dinner. And he had his cousin with him, or his nephew, nephew, with him to hold. He could, he was bouncing off the walls. Actually, oh, really? yes. Uh, we hadn't heard that it was that bad. Yeah. Oh, it got that bad. He would. I mean. I took him to a, a, a little restaurant two blocks away from uh, 78th Street and Park Avenue, where I lived, and he was literally, he was being held by his nephew, but he'd bump into the wall, then he'd pull him away from the wall, and he, his, his whole equilibrium was shot, but he was talking fine, everything like that, mm -hmm. and uh, then we went up after dinner to my apartment and played some records. Mm -hmm. And I saw that he, he, he was not in good shape. And I started talking to him like a Dutch uncle. I said, Johnny, you got to go for the operation. And he said, Bill, I don't want to be a vegetable. And I said, Johnny, you got to take a shot at it because you're going down the toilet now and uh, you know, you're bouncing off buildings and it's getting worse. He said, I know. And he said, no, I, you know, I know Ginger wants me to and she's begging for the last two years. And I said, Johnny, play the big game because this, this, this is dead end where you're, where it's, you know. And he said, I guess you're right. Call up Ginger and tell her I'll, I'll go for the surgery. I went to the phone in the library. I said, Ginger, I'm here with Johnny. He's on his train tomorrow night. He said he'll go for the surgery. And she said, oh, thank, oh, thank God. And I said, you know, sort of, and, and I said John, Johnny, I applaud you, you know, so and so and so and so. The third thing that got me is that he did become a vegetable, which he didn't want to do. Whether he should have just gone out uh, with nothing going on, I, I, I've always felt a little guilty about that. But I still thought you should play the big band and get a shot. Now, I talked to the surgeon uh, after the operation, mm -hmm. and they found it, they found it was cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, they, the surgeon said, eight out of ten are not cancer if it's in the brain and it's been in the brain a year and a half or two years as it was because the brain is so full of blood the cancer grows much faster and he'd had this for two years so he said I swore to you it'll be it'll be benign mm -hmm. and he said I opened him up and I said oh god and I said how could at the risk of being a boy how do you what, what how do you tell and he said Bill do you know the difference between a chicken and a duck and I took the little out and just closed him up. And then he became a vegetable and he would, the, uh, the room that you went and got the memorabilia out there, that was his, they made a little hospital room out and had nurses around the clock. Mm -hmm. I think it was over $350,000 a year of nurses. Mm -hmm. Ginger, I mean, awesome. And he was on the machine at the end. And basically a vegetable. So he wasn't that you know of conscious of a little bit. He, uh, he uh, as I, uh, once in a, one night I was coming to I take you out once or once every two weeks or something or once a week when I was out in Beverly Hills doing another show. And one time Ginger came into him in this hospital room and said, "Johnny, Bill's here. He's going to take me out to dinner." And he smiled, mm -hmm. which made me feel you know so marvelous. He just smiled. But his eyes were shut, and uh, we didn't know. We've never known whether it was malignant or no. It was, and, and Margaret wasn't sure. So. Oh, but the doctor said, "You know, there's going to be a duck and a chicken." Mm -hmm. He said, hey, "It was big cancer." Yeah. But I would have. He would have put money that it wasn't because it had been there so long. Brain tumors, he said, don't if they last long, are not cancers because, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So let's see, Mercer had surgery in, I think it was October of 75, and passed away in June of 76. So for that period, you happen to know, you dropped in from time to yes. time. Who else would have been around for Ginger and Oh, there was a guy called Red, Red Kramer. Right, Mark Kramer. Red, Mark Kramer was an old pal of mine, mm -hmm. and a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I didn't know, I, there seems to have been very, very, very few people who knew really. Yes, was it was very. Uh, it was not known how how deep his problem was. Mm -hmm. They kept it very quiet. So he didn't speak again, or to no. your knowledge, after the, the surgery. The smiles, the last thing I saw. Okay, one of the news clippings that we have has reports on his condition, and this was in November. Mm -hmm. 
which would have been shortly after the surgery, that, that he was able to sit up and, and watch a film. Oh, I hope that's true. And but, I didn't know. Well, but it's the news. I mean, we don't know if it's true either. I don't think it is, but I, I hope it could be true. So when he passed away... Oh, I'll hear you one night, that night, mm -hmm. in my apartment, when I, before I talked him into going into the surgery, I was playing this new thing called Bossa Nova, mm -hmm. and I think it was a, the Sinatra angle with Jobim, mm -hmm. you know, and it's beautiful, you know, and it was a, a new beat and the whole thing, and I remember sitting on the edge of the couch with his eyes shut, looking, at the, uh, looking straight down, and his eyes are shut, listening to this music, and at the end of the, the song, this beautiful bossa nova song, he said, God, why didn't the kids go this way? Instead of rock. Mm -hmm. Why didn't the kids go this way? And there's some so after his death, you and Bob Bach then produced a memorial service? Is yes, I, yeah, I did a for ASCAP. Mm -hmm. uh, ASCAP called me and would I put together a, 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 oh, a tribute? A tribute, right? We didn't call it memorials; we called them all tribute. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a—I th I forgot what theater. I did. Oh, I think I did it. At, where did I do it? I think I did it at the uh, Music Box, uh, Irving, um, Irving, uh, Irving Berlin. Mm -hmm. Said, "Worship Johnny." And he said, Bill, you got it for nothing. Just take the, you know, do it. The, we did it in the afternoon, I think noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, Mel Torme. We had, uh, oh gosh, I forget the people on that thing. Uh, Al Hibbler. He sang uh, uh, Blues in the Night. Uh, they had about eight or nine people and telling anecdotes about Johnny and then singing a song or two or something like that. It been about an hour. Mm -hmm. It was a good show. Mrs. Bach said it was lovely. It was. And that I should ask you about it. Yes. And Bob uh, helped produce that. Mm -hmm. Bob Bach. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was on that. You have to, uh, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think. We have some photographs from that. I think from you that. You could around the piano? No. No, I think it's afterward. Because the centerpiece was the piano and uh, uh, I forgot who the, we had several piano players sit in and change around and they were all on stools around the piano the, mm -hmm. the, the, the guests and it was oh yeah we do have a picture of that. yeah and it's all very relaxed because Johnny was relaxed he was not stilted or anything and it was like a, a, a party yeah his sort of relaxed personality comes through in all the photographs perfect, yeah. I told Mrs. Bach I think we have he was on a White House Record Commission mm -hmm. and we have a couple photographs that were taken of the the members of this thing right. kind of spread around. Mm -hmm. I think it's the uh, Oval Office, I'm mm -hmm. not sure, the Blue Room, something like that. And everybody's sitting there being nice. And in, in the picture that gets used the most, he's sitting there very proper like mm -hmm. everybody else. But in the other one, he's pulling up his socks. I know. And they caught, have you seen that one? No. And he's looking up and it's like, yeah, you got me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the look, but that cute little pixie look he had. Mm -hmm. And that cute little <laughs> laugh. <laughs> His baby pictures, even. Oh, we yeah, have very, very young yeah. baby pictures, yeah. and the dimples, the little and dimps. this whole yeah. bottom part of his face is... Johnny was cute. He was a cute guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked to Oscar Hammerstein once about him. You did? And uh, I said, because I, I, I'd become, you know, uh, he was became my hero, Johnny. Mm -hmm. And my father worked with Oscar Hammerstein, and so I knew Oscar through my father's work with him. And I remember it, uh, it was at a, a Lamb's Club luncheon, and uh, before we went into dinner, and I said, we were talking about songwriters, so I said, Mr. Hammerstein, how do you feel about Johnny Mercer? And he said, Bill, I could no more like, he said, he's the most perfect American lyricist alive. Yeah. American, pure American. He was? Mm -hmm. In New York, if he had his pla choice of places to go, mm -hmm. where would he go? Where would it be his he, hangouts he, or his he, He'd like a, you mean a, for dinner or something? Well, let's say for leisure, for if you know to go for a drink. Well, he'd like to go to some place where where uh, where there's music. Like uh, you go down the village always. Mm -hmm. I never forget one time he said, uh, he said, "Hey, Bill, I saw, a, I heard a singer last night that knocked my socks out. She's quite homely." Homely as sin, but she sings like an angel. I said her name is Barbara, Barbara uh, uh, Stanson or something like that. And he said, but she sings like an angel. 
So he would go and, and want to know what, what, and he loved Dixie. And I tell you, he and Eddie Condon were old pals. Oh, they were. And one New Year's Eve, I had a, a girl that I was taking out at the time from England, and Ginger and Johnny, we, went, we just did one what after another New Year's Eve, and along came, uh, in one of the places, was Eddie Conan, very drunk, very drunk. And uh, not obnoxious, but almost, you know, mm -hmm. but just hanging on. And uh, we, we, Johnny said, come on, we're going, you know, we're going over to here. We, go, we went to about four different places. And Ginger said, do we have to keep, you know, maybe we ought to see if we can get away from this, because he was just kind of hanging in. And Johnny said, no, he's a friend of mine. He stays with us. And of course, Eddie Connor was a giant in his own right. Mm -hmm. And he worshipped Johnny. Boy, what a man. A good friend. In Los Angeles, Hollywood area, mm -hmm. where would you find him if, if you were looking for him? Uh, let's see, uh, it'd be where he's hangouts. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually people's houses, you know, I don't think they went out, but if they did go out, he would go maybe to Chasen's once in a while and stuff like that. But, it, you know, basically it would be uh, at people's it houses. Sounds. Hank Mancini's or, or, you know, it's kind of a, a club mm -hmm. in that league, you know, and they all had each other to each other's houses. In talking with Margaret and Jack, they were they had been talking with somebody about what was he like during rehearsals of one of the shows, mm -hmm. I forget which, in New York. And they were told that he sort of didn't like to hang around the rehearsals, that he'd rather go off to a jazz club. Oh, yes, Somewhere absolutely. Somewhere was that the case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly, they were absolutely right. One thing I, I, I said, Johnny, you know, I, I said, you know, you're the best of them all as far as I'm concerned. And so, so what, do you have any disappointment? He said, yes, I have one. I, I never had a Broadway hit. And that's the one thing. Now, he had closes, close hits, but uh, like uh, St. Louis Woman was a marvelous score. It didn't take off. It, it, it was criticized and didn't happen. And then the other one, what was the uh, hillbilly one? Uh, uh, Little Abner. Little Abner. was good, mm -hmm. but it was not the King and I or, uh, you know, a big, and that's one thing that he wanted to have, at least one giant Broadway hit, and it never happened. That I think that was his biggest disappointment uh, in his career. And I said, you're going to knock stories about I mean, a song like Laura, and, and the, he said, no, they're, they're modest song, but I never I never had a hit on Broadway. You know the modest telegram that Oscar Hammerstein sent him when... Uh, Which one is that? Uh, world, just the beginning of the war, mm -hmm. Johnny had written a song called Laura, which is a beautiful song, a movie. It's lovely. And uh, Paris had fallen, mm -hmm. and Oscar wrote as a poem, The Last Time I Saw Paris and sent it to Kern as a, just a, as a gesture. It, it, was just, it wasn't supposed to be a song necessarily, it was just a beautiful poem about how he felt about Paris. And Kern put it to music and it became the last one and won the award. Mm -hmm. And Laura was up. And Oscar sent him a telegram. Oscar won, the, you know, and the, Kern won, and he said, Dear Johnny, you was robbed. Love, Oscar. Mm -hmm. Oscar was a sweet man, too. Sounds like it. But I love that. You was robbed. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know if that's one of the telegrams we have. I'll have to go yeah, back and look. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but getting back to his n disinterest in hanging around rehearsals, mm. for a lyricist, what is doing a Broadway show like? I mean, you, you must work in advance and, and work with right. the story and get things set, but then there are all these changes that happen and transformations So that's that when happen. you've got to change the lyrics or, or write a whole new song. Do, do you stay with things minute by minute and day by some day? Some do, some or? don't. Some uh, go to the bar and wait to be called to do a thing, mm -hmm. and some will be there all the time and, and, uh, and be involved. Mm -hmm. So Mercer's style was, everybody has a different style, yeah, and, and his was mm -hmm. no more different mm -hmm. than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Um, you've told several, you know, vignettes of, of kind of what was like with him. What, if someone were to ask you, what do you remember most? What would come to your mind? 
or what incidents or what events yeah. or just sort of what what comes to the top well they, it's like a it's like a song what's your favorite song i've got a 20 favorite songs i've got a uh, hundred you know uh, there's a hundred moments that i remember of john if, if i if the brain just gets to the those sections i remember his is that smile and the personality and the warmth and the humbleness he was not arrogant there was not one arrogant bone in his body as good as he was he was not arrogant must have been kind of unusual in his business I boy <laughs> hello operator <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because usually those guys, and you know, it, it's fine to be that way if that's what you are, but not John. He was just straight, straight. Oh, well, uh, that's not true. For, I'll tell you, but okay. Yeah. Did that that humbleness and that straightforwardness, um, in your opinion? have a lot to do with nature of Capitol Records? Oh, I think it. so. I think he was the, yeah, the instigator of Capitol Records and uh, along with the... Uh, Glenn Wallach That's it. And Buddy DeSilva. That's it. But I think he was the driving for uh, the chemistry of that thing and uh, uh, that's why it, it did what it did because the, the love that people had for Johnny and the singers and they knew they would be protected by him like, like uh, uh, What's her name? Peggy uh, Lee. Uh, Peggy Lee and and uh, that used to be with the Pied Pipers. Uh, Joe Stafford. Uh, Joe Stafford. They do uh, under his wing. They were protected mm -hmm. because he was an, a songwriter, songwriter, and 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 a singer. And I love. Hey, my I think one of my favorite singers is John Mercer. When he sings the lyric, there's nobody that sings better. One for my baby, not Sinatra, not Astaire. No. When Johnny sings it, it is, it, to me, is another dimension. It's very much from his heart, that lyric. No, that's what happened. And of course, when you the guy that sing it, wrote it, it gives that other explosion of greatness about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love the way he sang. I like his versions of his things oh. and other people's things. Yeah, right, right. That's part of what I liked about the Bing Crosby show, that little parlor game. Yeah. With so and so, wrote with so and so. Yeah, yeah. With so -and -so. That was a cute. Uh, yeah. it, it was. It's cute. Mm -hmm. I use it for training my students. None of them know. Yeah. They never heard of it because they only know basically rock and roll now. They come back and they say, "That's neat." Hey, yeah. Uh, I say, "Okay, wa watch the video again." <laughs> yeah, then get get used it, to some good music. It's a primer. Good you know, for you. It, it gets them started. Uh -huh. Uh, let's well, see here. Uh, what else? Or, uh, uh, no, I'm through. Okay. Who else would you suggest for us to interview? Now we've talked to Gene Bach and Margaret Whiting and Jack Wrangler and Hugh Ford and of course Mrs. Mercer's housekeeper to, yeah. to sort of discuss. He was, he was his cousin or something. Well, Walter Rivers. Was, Walter. Yeah, he passed away. Oh, that's right. We didn't didn't Walter get to him Rivers. in time. I have. Um, I'm supposed to call Jenny Mancini. Now that would be good because he did Moon River. Right. And there'd be a moment there. A couple of songs with John. Mm -hmm. that, and she's darling. She's she, a sweet lady. She sounds oh, like it. Oh, she's cozy. She's a marvelous gal. No, that would be good. Jenny Mancini. Gosh. I don't know anybody in Savannah, you know. No, we're working on that. Um, yeah. We found one of his boyhood friends whose mm -hmm. older brother was a closer boyhood friend, mm -hmm. and we're, we're mm -hmm. kind of following that. Yeah. And then um, Ginger's niece lives outside of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of looking at that yeah, end yeah. of the family. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm trying to think of Ginger, too. Uh, <laughs> Ginger was just Mrs. Mercer. I mean, her whole life was around John. I talked about that a little bit with Jack and Margaret, mm -hmm. and because we we tried to find out, you know, did she have, were there friends of hers that we should talk to? Were there yeah, people right. who could kind of fill things out? And the answer was kind of no towards the end. Mm -hmm. And I think Jack's comment probably summed it up. He said that Hollywood. That they too busy. Are they having a late lunch? Aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> she said that he said that Hollywood was a cruel town that way. That yes. when your spouse was the. Yeah. The celebrity that after that person you were divorced or separated or or yeah. widowed or whatever that it was that much more difficult. Very. Yeah, uh, Holly was a stay in strange the, in place. The swing. But he made a lot of money out there. He sure did. He did made a lot of a lot of a lot of beautiful songs. One of the sad things about the situation with John is that 
a lot of his, when he was under contract to MGM or whoever it was, they owned that music. I mean, it, it, it was for, for pay. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and then when, when that was all dissolved, it still was owned by Metro or whatever. So it was a, a bit of sadness there. They did, <coughs> in recent years, the estate has founded its own publishing company. Yes, right. And has been reclaiming. Great, see, that's... It's mostly the early things at this yeah, point. Yeah, right, right. Because of the yeah, times that that's things right. uh, good, good point. start lapsing. Mm -hmm. But they've been recovering and reclaiming yeah. a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think that may have pretty well covered it for now. I told Mrs. Bach and I and I told Margaret we'll probably ask to talk to you again. Sure, anytime. As, as we start putting these pieces together right. and seeing where right. things overlap. And remind me to gaps. get those damn records. Of, of, what else of, might you have that would be on tape well, or I, on I've got, that do, would Have you seen Johnny in a hotel, some hotel? It was an afternoon luncheon, and he was the MC, and he was doing all his songs and singing them and doing little anecdotes. It wasn't the 92nd Street Y. No, no. This was at a hotel okay. like the Waldorf or something. Or we have some photographs we can't identify. No, but this is a video. Oh, a video. This is a video, and oh, it's no. sensational. And he's singing, and he's talking about going on a cruise with Ginger. No, we don't have that. And uh, some man on board the ship said, well, what does your husband do? And she said, write songs. They said, no, I know, but what does he do? <laughs> I mean, he was doing cute little jokes about himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he also told them all the story that uh, about the girl that wrote this lyric, the title for a song. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sadie Wimmerstedt. Is that her name? Yeah. Yeah. I want to be around to right. pick up the pieces. When somebody breaks your heart. That's right. And then he tells that cute darling story, and then he sings it. Mm -hmm. It's all on tape. I got it on tape. We do. Yeah. Okay. That whole afternoon with Johnny. Oh, wonderful. Singing, so maybe I can get that to you. We'd be interested, or at least knowing where it came from, so we. And can there's get a it. model's interview with Hoagie Carmichael and Johnny. You've probably got that. No. I got him talking about music writing. You do? Yeah. I, we'd be interested in that. I've so. got him talking about Harold Arlen. Oh, how wonderful. I've got it, uh, uh, Harold Arlen talking about Johnny. Even better. And how he felt about it. Mm -hmm. You should have Good, that. I hope. <laughs> oh, are they you kidding? some beautiful, beautiful Worship work together. Time. Anything that you have or can give us a lead on? We'd appreciate okay. because again, it's from our point, since we now, I'm not going to be home until j till the end of May. That's fine. But you got to remind me because I, you know, just I'll drop you a letter. Do you have my uh, phone number up in Connecticut? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Well, I thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Are there welcome. any other thoughts, comments you'd like to add? All right. Oh, you mean now? Is there anything before we close? I can't. I'm trying to think of any little more anecdotes because the anecdotes are the fun thing. Mm -hmm. Like the like waiting for the red light, and Johnny telling me the lyric <laughs> has to be in a show, not in a straight song, mm -hmm. because it's too immoral to be in a straight song. It works if there's a <laughs> setup for it. Well, if it does, I'll, I'll I'll come back to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're quite welcome.